Come on, Snuggy. Why won't you speak to me? Oh, language snuggles. Look, I know you want higher compensation, but we don't even make money off of this yet. Yeah, I know, but we have to follow the advice that that social media person gave me, so you gotta put on this outfit. All right, fine. No costume this year. Come here and take off that outfit, even though that hat is really cute. Welcome back, cool cats and cat allies alike, to Six Degrees of Cats, the world's best and only cat-themed culture, history, and science podcast. Before I forget, I just wanted to thank all of you so much for the love in Season 1. And if you're new to the pod, you definitely should check those episodes out, because despite our journeys in that season from Greece to Rome to Scandinavia, from the early days of the cat-human friendship to the present time— we still have barely scratched the surface of the threadbare couch that represents all things connected to kitties in this life. I'm so happy to kick off the second season of Six Degrees of Cats. Who am I? Well, if you didn't know already, it is I, Captain Kitty, or Amanda B. And you earlier heard from me and my co-executive producer, Snuggles, who is also joined here by her brother, Uncle Dad, not sure about their relationship, to be honest, Binky, <coughs> neither of whom, for the record, have consented to wear the very adorable, very expensive costumes I got for the occasion, which is Halloween. <coughs> ah, yes. Halloween, the holiday of frights and scaries, horrifying things like ghouls, goblins, demons, team-building activities at corporate retreats, and stop and chats on the street, celebrated in North America on October 31st. Trick or treat! Unlike Valentine's Day, which we talked about in my Cats vs. Cupid episode, the first images that come to mind when you think of Halloween are pumpkins, ghosts, and kitties, who are, allegedly, and along with other fun critters like toads, frogs, dogs, and ducks, the friends of Satan, a.k.a. Lucifer, Lucifer. a.k.a. the devil. The guy goes by a lot of names, but enough about him. Let's talk about his alleged consorts. (laughs) Witches. Or were they? As a heads up, this episode will include some rather colorful language. Partly because, well, curses and Halloween go hand in hand. And how apropos. Halloween comes with pumpkins. Pumpkin spice. Cursing is the spice of language, don't like you think? Mace. Did you know mace is both a weapon ingredient and a flavoring agent? I digress. Back to witches. So, Binky, what comes to mind when you think of a witch? Ha ha, very funny. Be serious now, not me. Okay. Nature? Herbs? Goddess? Oh, wait, no, no, no. Sorry, Pinky. (laughs) I didn't mean modern practitioners of Wicca and other religions that call their followers witches. Good point. Thanks for reminding me about that. And modern witches, thanks for your grace. We're going to be talking actually about the image of alleged witches that come into the pop culture space from places like Disney and stuff. Binky, pull up some images here. Okay, here we are. All right. You have an old woman. She lives alone. She has kind of wild hair. No comment on her complexion and profile. That's kind of rude. She wears all black. She has kind of a strange hat on. Oh, and there's a large black cauldron. Oh, something's looking back at us. In the corner of that picture. Oh, kitties. Excuse me. She has a few cats. I think she's a quote unquote crazy cat lady. That's what we're here to talk about. Both witches and cat ladies, to this date, have a bit of a uh, branding problem, as our guest from season one, the Trap King himself, Sterling Davis, has acknowledged. I would gather the volunteers and get them 
get volunteers to help me in different colonies, different areas. And it was always women. It would only be women. And who start telling me, you know, Sterling, I want to help. I want to do this, but I can't go to that. I can be cursed out. And that was when I was thinking to myself, oh, I need to make her cool. She's not just some crazy cat lady. How many in your neighborhood called the trouble? She's actually helping. So that's what we're here to talk about. The origins of the quote unquote crazy cat lady. <laughs> okay, that's enough, Banky. Which, like the cauldron in the visual I just described, is a total crock of shit. <gasps> Look. The tagline, crazy cat lady, may seem harmless. I mean, we touched on this in our Father's Day episode. The insidious gender stereotypes that continue to uh, dog our societies and make owning cats a thing that women, and exclusively women, do alone. Which is somehow supposed to be a funny visual? Whatever. When it comes to witches, well, those Disney images didn't come from nowhere. Nor did the stigma we attach to people who look and act like... that. I'm thinking specifically of the Salem Witch Trials, which were held in the late 17th century in Salem, Massachusetts. The Salem Witch Trials are pretty well documented and ensconced in the canon of American literature, thanks to playwright Arthur Miller's incredible work, The Crucible. There are so many podcasts and books out there on the witch trials and all the horrible things that were done to those folks accused of being witches. I'll include a few in the show notes for you to check out. So, about all them witches. Why were these people seen to be agents of the devil? Well, often it was specifically... Women doing femininity wrong. Women doing relationships and sex wrong, women doing religion wrong, and women doing, like, peopling wrong. The historical association of, like, witches with cats. Perfectly said by our first expert. I am Dr. Megan Goodwin. I'm the author of Abusing Religion, which is a book about religion and abuse, like it says in the title. I am the co-host and co-producer of Keeping It 101, a Killjoy's Introduction to Religion podcast. I do media and tech consulting for the Crossroads Project at Princeton, which is a loose-funded project that platforms and raises the profile of scholars, activists, community organizers, artists, and teachers who focus on Black, African-American, and Africana religions. By the time this comes out, I guess I will officially be co-president of the Bardo Institute for Religion and Public Policy. It will come as no surprise to you, returning listeners, that religion resurfaces this season. Recall our episode on Freya's cats. Our Norse folklore expert, Terry Gunnell, hinted at a pattern in which women in roles of moral or structural authority found themselves pushed further and further aside as time progressed. Same game, different name. So... This brings us back to who gets protected as validly religious and who gets left out, right? Because the folks who found themselves on the other side of, say, witchcraft accusations. I used to teach a witches class at Northeastern, so this is local history. When folks get accused of being witches, overwhelmingly, particularly on this continent, the apparatus that is used to convict them of that is both religious and scientific. There's not a space in between those categories at this time. And we know that to this date, both religion and science are brought into many strong discussions about how to woman correctly. What the accusations are are about science and religion on their face. And of course, cats got caught in the crosshairs of that as well. It's something we experience to this day because of that quote-unquote crazy cat lady stereotype. A cultural, and it turns out, historic trope. One that can sometimes be intended to land lightheartedly. I mean, I'm going to own that honorary title here and there. But it is often maliciously directed at, well, people perceived to be doing femininity wrong, as Dr. Goodwin put it earlier, which she experienced firsthand. I had a really unpleasant uh, interaction with a dude at a gas station a couple of years ago where he was just taking up all of the space. And I was trying to get around him so that I could fuel my car. 
And I don't remember what I said, but he like drove off and was like, say hi to your cats for me. I'm a scholar of rhetoric and gender and sexuality. And it took about three milliseconds to realize that what he was saying when he said, say hi to your cats is, you're a fucking dyke. The assumption that women with cats are sexually wrong, gendered in a way that is not allowed in public, that they must be alone, that they must be miserable, that has stuck with me. And it has been interesting thinking about the ways that cats stand in for, I think, if not rebelliousness, at least a kind of stubborn individuality and a refusal to do things on other people or species terms. Yeah. Unfortunately, not obeying or complying is a thing that definitely gets under many people's skin, especially those who are used to everyone going along with what they say for whatever reason. So, of course, when it came to an older woman not doing the whole husband, kids, church, looking hot for the man, folk in town thing, you're going to have some taking personal offense for that stuff, even though it's really none of their business. But seriously, folks, what exactly was it about their witchy business that specifically got folks' hackles so raised that it became a matter of life and death? Well, hold on to your hats. We'll talk more about this after the break. Before the break, the wonderful Dr. Megan Goodwin oriented us on the historic and systemic reasons that some women were designated witches and treated very rudely as an understatement. And now the time has come. Gather around and perhaps make yourself a nice hot toddy if you are of the alcohol persuasion, which, for the record, is lemon, tea, cloves optional, and whiskey. Whiskey for ye teetotalers goes back 4,000 years, at least. According to the aptly named The Scotch Whiskey Experience website, the word whiskey comes from the word Uska Bay. I will spell that out in the show notes. Which is an anglicized version of the term Ishkibaha. From Middle Irish and Scots Gaelic, which literally means water of life. According to my research, whiskey was either originated by a bunch of bored monks who brought the tradition to the Scottish Highlands, or it was discovered and perfected by the people themselves in their homes. And it's made of barley, which is a grain. Grain. Remember how we talked about the grain trade in season one with Dr. Melinda Zeter? We touched on domestication, both of animals and plants. Now, it's time to think about more than just bread when it comes to grains. Or rather, who brought in the dough from the drink? At least for a while. Take it from our second guest of this episode. My name is Sarah Lohman. I am a culinary historian, and I am author of the book, Eight Flavors, The Untold Story of American Cuisine. You can uh, get on top of everything at sarahloman.com. That's links to all my good stuff, my newsletters, my upcoming events, my Patreon. Also, if you just search for me, Sarah Lohman, L-O-H-M-A-N, you will find me as well. In my discussion with Sarah, I asked her, what do witches have to do with whiskey? And what does this all have to do with this crazy cat lady stuff we talked about earlier? I think we need to go take a look at the history of labor and work. Throughout most of history, women were the brewers. Because if we're talking about traditional divisions of labor before Industrial Revolution, men were out there doing the farming. They were growing the crops. They were growing the animals. You know, they were doing all of that labor. And women were doing all of the processing. Maybe they they were doing some butchering, certainly, but they were, you know, taking the whole animal and, you know, preserving it and cooking it and making sausages and doing all of that. So growing falls under that in that they're not out there growing the grain, but they're taking the grain and processing it. So 
women were the commercial brewers up until like the 15th century. And then women were doing the majority of the home brewing up through the middle of the 19th century in America anyway. And here's where the witches come in. So we've got a single woman, maybe older. She's got a cat. At least one to help her keep down the rodent population. This continues to describe my current life. She needs a big cast iron vessel to boil the wort in, to essentially prepare the beer for fermentation. So she's got a big old cast iron pot that she's stirring around. Also, when the beer is finished and ready for sale, it was traditional to hang a broom over the front door of where she lived. So it was like the signpost that said, hey, the beer is ready, come and buy it. But if she was selling at a festival, she would wear a big, tall, pointy hat so that you could see where the beer vendor was above the crowd. And so when you think of like a Halloween witch, (laughs) these are all the visual associations we have with it, too. So I also want to point out that this isn't my research or my theory. There's been a couple great articles and papers about this. If you could look those up and, and cite the names, that would be great. I don't have them on the top of my head. Glad to oblige. Sarah is referencing the work of writer and U.S. historian Judith M. Bennett. Her book, Ale, Beer, and Brewsters in England, Women's Work in a Changing World, does a great job addressing the things that Sarah's talking about. So there you go, folks. Happy Halloween. That witch costume is actually a 15th century pilgrim's outfit, or a sexy 15th century pilgrim's outfit, depending on how you roll with your Halloween costumes. This is really cool, but how in the world did we lose the connection between witches and whiskey? Following along a thought Dr. Goodwin had shared. If you look at the history, overwhelmingly the folks who wound up accused of being witches were women who were disrupting lines of male property inheritance. It was about the money, right? It's not not about religion. It's about all of it. Here's where the real evil comes in. So women have had a huge part of brewing for most of brewing's history. The vast majority of brewing's history, and it's only really been recently that it's fallen into the domain of men. Women often brewed for their families throughout time. But if we're talking historically about selling beer, commercial brewing in Europe, women were also doing that through the 15th and 16th centuries. And that switched in the 15th century as brewing became a guild profession. So basically, guilds, think of them kind of like a union. You know, it's an organization of people in a certain craft, and they were male-dominated. So not only did it become a guild craft, but also different laws were passed, like the purity laws in Germany, that put in very specific limits in place on how you can make your beer and what went into your beer. So the industry was changing, and a lot of that meant that males wanted to take this over as a profession. And so one of the ways they did this is to villainize women brewers as witches. So how were they able to do this? Here we go, folks. Well, let's say it is the 13th century and you are uh, a brewer. You're a woman and it is likely that you are unmarried. You might be a widow or you might be a spinster like me. And you, (laughs) shockingly, might enjoy your independence. For whatever reason, you're not on this traditional path, okay? And so one of the ways that you could make money and have a business that was socially acceptable in this time was to brew. So basically, men who wanted to take over the brewing industry just slandered and gave a bad name to women brewers and turned the tools of their trade into the symbols that we associate in the modern day with like a real stereotypical witch. These days, we colloquially say witch hunt to describe campaigns of persecution, which is in of itself kind of controversial. I will say that it certainly hasn't just been successful, powerful, unique women with cats who have endured these types of malicious campaigns with that very same objective. Here's Dr. Goodwin again. If you dig truly not even very much deeper at all, it becomes very quickly evident that, yeah, capitalism and religion and politics, not that those are separate in any way, if left to their own devices, operate 
to privilege the folks who are already in power, or if they have started losing any of that power, to make sure they get it back right quick. Here's a recent example of this kind of campaign in our not-too-distant memory. My brain immediately went to a Dr. Sarah Tabor place because she does a lot of really fascinating work on food cultures and particularly farming cultures and how they have harmed Asian folks, Black folks, Latinx folks. I had gotten the history that we all get, which is, you know, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and then everybody agreed that Japanese folks needed to be incarcerated for the good of the country. Horrifying in retrospect. The thread that really rewired my brain was the one that she did on Japanese incarceration in the 1940s, overwhelmingly being a land grab by white farmers who were not making as efficient use of the farmland that they had available. Farmers of Japanese origin were used to growing in more hostile and more constraining circumstances. So they were fucking killing it, which meant that they were beating out the competition. And when they were incarcerated, the white farmers got their land. And overwhelmingly, the Japanese farmers never got it back. It's one of those things where the narrative given is, oh, it's about national security. It's about what's doing best for the country. And we continue to see this playing out to this day. Sorry, folks. I know it was supposed to be a fun episode with Halloween, but this is Debbie Downer. Welcome to my ship. So I guess this Halloween, kids, whenever you don those witch outfits or watch those horror films, remember, there's nothing horrifying about single women or cats or the competition. What is horrifying is the idea that children everywhere are told so many lies. Chief among them? That being a single person with your own successful home brewing business and the most beautiful creature to shit in a box as your little bestie beastie isn't the best thing ever. For crying out loud, that's the opposite of crazy, lady. That's called living the dream. This is taking us to the present tense. Let's bring it from witches to whiskers to whiskey on a slightly uh, lighter note. Now, since the Salem Witch Trials days, brewing has become a billion-dollar corporatized industry. And outside of Halloween, I'm not really seeing a lot of witches running distilleries here. Sarah corroborates this. Whiskey and craft brewing is very, very male-dominated and very, very white male-dominated, too. There was like a Black Brewers Conference for the first time. So we're starting to see some shifts in that. But again, it's still very, very male-oriented. So we have some work to do to get more witching in the kitchen. I guess we won't solve that now. It's definitely part of the larger cultural shift necessary to decouple gender from, well, values, honestly. But it's at least a little promising that the legacy of these Bruja brewers remains in the form of their furry little apprentices. You know, almost every brewery and distillery has at least one cat for the exact same reasons that people in Mesopotamia and brewers in Mesopotamia and brewers in medieval England had cats too, to keep control of the rodent population in these spaces that are storing a lot of grain. We can look at the history of cats as being very tied into grain production. Because of that, at the same time, we're starting to produce beer as well, and beer would lead to distillates. So they're also very much tied to the history of alcohol. Yet another wonderful thing about kitties. For our final guest speaker in this episode, I'm grateful to have had the chance to meet the boss of two distillery cats who told me what it was like to be, well, a cat boss, I guess. I don't know. Colin, take it away. Okay, sure. I'm Colin Spoolman. I'm co-founder and distiller at Kings County Distillery in Brooklyn, New York. We can be found on Instagram at Kings County Distillery or on Twitter at Kings Co. Whiskey. It's worth noting here that the lineage of this brand of booze brings the homebrew origins to Brooklyn by way of the Scotch-Irish immigrants who settled into the Appalachian region of North America in the 18th century a heritage close to Colin's heart. I grew up in eastern Kentucky, the moonshine part of Kentucky, which is to say the sort of coal mining Appalachian part. I sort of began to understand that this was my cultural inheritance, and I was intrigued by 
whiskey and moonshine and that interplay between folk Appalachian culture and this thing that was happening in Brooklyn, which was this farm to table interest in things that were made at a smaller scale or according to an older tradition, which suited with moonshine very well. Bourbon, as it is, had, had become very homogenous and commercialized, such that there weren't really a lot of small producers anymore. So to be able to get into moonshine as a way to rediscover a sort of lost art of distillation was really how things got started. And that required getting a license as a commercial distiller in 2010. And we've been growing pretty much ever since then. In no small part, thanks to the furry defenders of the grains. Carlos and Jeffy, I think we're brothers, but they were our distillery cats. They really came, maybe not precisely as a result of Hurricane Sandy, but when the Navy Yard flooded, including our building, one of the side effects after that flood was hordes of roving rats and mice that had been displaced from wherever they had lived before the flood. We had a vermin problem in the distillery, so we solicited help in the form of Carlos and Jeffy, who lived at the distillery. Carlos was more bloodthirsty and more aggressive and got more mice. And then I think Jeffy sort of just kind of like lived off his coattails. Cat tails. But Jeffy, it was his job really to patrol and to scare away mice. (laughs) It worked. We never really saw a mouse. The problem was gone and, and it was remarkable how successful it was, it was actually the most humane way to scare off the mice as opposed to trapping them or poisoning them. Sadly, neither Carlos nor Jeffy are at Kings County Distillery anymore. Carlos passed away maybe three years after he was hired. And then Jeffy basically lived out to retirement and now lives upstate. His role was really to catch the mice, which he did. Which he did. Thank you, Carlos, Jeffy, then all the kitties who kept the rat and mice effluvia from ruining our harvests. Cats, the eco-friendly humane pesticide. Perfect solution. And the best kind of colleague with whom to enjoy a stiff drink after a long day at the distillery. Am I right? Well, we have cats and women to thank for whiskey and breweries. And we have capitalism and competition crowding them out of their own craft. Which wasn't actually witchcraft, but craft brewing. Or rather, we should say witchcraft brewing. Huh? Does that work? Alrighty. Let's all raise a glass to the wonderful network of feline vermin fighters and their stewards working tirelessly to bring joy and maybe a little pain to our weekends and evenings. And let us all toast the crazy cat lady of the hour. May this misunderstood, fashion-forward entrepreneur and food scientist finally get her due. All right, everybody. It's been so fun to launch this season with this specific episode, which has been top of mind for everybody since I told them about Six Degrees of Cats. I want to thank my excellent guest speakers, the religious scholar, Dr. Megan Goodwin, our wonderful food historian and writer, Sarah Lohman, and Kings County Distillery founder, brewer, and author, Colin Spoolman, for sharing their time, their deep knowledge, and their great humor. While the opinions are my own, the research and work is theirs. So if you'd like to learn more about them, please do check out our show notes, which also includes the references and research that went into this episode. And as always, big thanks to my team, which includes my co-executive producers, Binky and Snuggles, who refused to wear the very cute sailor outfits that we had made for them. I want to thank you for sticking with me. We have so much more to talk about this season. So... Until next time, stay tuned, you beautiful. I appreciate you. And remember, everything is connected. Six Degrees of Cats is produced, written, edited, and hosted by yours truly, Captain Kitty, a.k.a. Amanda B. 
please subscribe to our mailing list by going to l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash six degrees of cats or look us up on all those social media platforms. You'll be first in line for the extra audio and more treats if you connect with us there. All episodes are dedicated to the misunderstood, the marginalized, the resilient, and the weird. And of course, all the cats we've loved and lost. He would always come in at night. We had a real established routine that when Matthew was sort of closing up, it would, you know, sort of bang on the doors and that was the code to come back in.